really appreciate all your help with this and welcome catapult universe it's uh great to have everybody with us today i see the numbers growing i hope everybody had a great day so far and i truly hope that the next hour will prove useful for you so it's not lost on me what it means to spend an extra hour after a long day's work listening to somebody yapping at you across zoom and so i hope to get some value across this platform um, you saw the title, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, maybe a little facetious. Do we really need another composite course? You'll see that um, my email is at the bottom left. I always encourage folks to keep in touch with me. I'll re-put, it'll be on the last slide as well. You'll see it again. So feel free if anything's not answered by the end of the day to uh, reach out. I like to make new pen pals whenever possible. So let's jump right into it. Um, let's see. A little bit about me so you can kind of frame where I come from and decide if my message has any relevance for you. I basically wear three hats. I have three jobs. Probably the biggest, first and foremost, is I'm an educator. I teach at University of Pacific Dental School and have done so ever since graduation in 1991. So yeah, that's 30 some odd years of teaching. Along that entire same time frame, I've been in private practice and continue to be in private practice today. So the second biggest hat I wear is I'm a wet finger dentist working every single day. And then, of course, what brings me here to you today is I'm a member of Catapult. I've been on the podium for a number of years. I do both live and virtual education. I work with the industry. I'm a product tester. Our office is a beta site. So that entire scenario brings me in front of you. And I always want to put a plug in. Here's just a bunch of thumbnail shots of a lot of the speakers, great, great minds in Catapult. And so if you ever get a chance, by all means, log on, listen to them, see them live whenever you, you can. We have a lot of multi-level educational offerings. And our goal is that we, or our motto is we check our ego at the door. We meet multiple times a year. We exchange relevant data, science together. So hopefully you're getting a better filtered message when one of us speaks where you know it's kind of grounded in science and reality. That said, along with every presentation, there's always a disclaimer. Um, I have to let everybody know that I have zero financial interest in the company Ultradent. They are paying me to educate and that's it. So whether you buy a product or not, makes no difference to me. My goal is education. However, my line in the sand is when I'm speaking about certain technologies, products, materials, I won't do so unless I buy them and use them in my own practice. So we pay for them out of our overhead. And these are things that you might see that we've completely integrated into our formulary. So with that said, I'll start with this framework. And this is a common theme when I present. This is the average US hourly overhead in the dental practice. Uh, this may shock some people. And of course, geographically, this ranges. But this is the average. And many of you probably fall right in the middle of that average. This has definitely gone up since pandemic. Um, the $7 a minute resonates in my mind all the time. It's especially important to me because I'm teaching three days a week. I only have a day and a week of production time in the office. This is going to only move up going forward. Everybody knows that we're in an inflationary crisis. We've seen simple things like PPE, not to mention all our materials, labor costs, everything skyrocket. And especially right after pandemic, we had a lot of governors to us. We uh, had to see one patient at a time, reduce the volume, wait for aerosol to settle. Patients were nervous about getting work done. People were putting off elective procedures. Long story short, speed, efficiency, predictability, uh, how we look at outcomes, how successful we are, all these things, the number of redos we have to do are imperative factors when we consider efficiency and profitability. Now, go back to when I finished school, and this was just a few decades ago, our decision-making process was much easier. If I had to do a filling, I basically had amalgams to choose from in the posteriors, and we were starting to dabble in composites. And we were, with select faculty in our clinic, we would do anterior composites and occasionally sneak in a posterior composite. Fast forward to when I graduated, and we were doing 90% composites right away out of school, even though I would say we were under-trained on them. And then when patients had more breakdown, we had basically two materials to choose from. Gold crowns, or if there was an aesthetic concern, we cut back some alloy and stack porcelain on top of it. 
We had a couple of cements to choose from, the old-fashioned zinc phosphate, and then slowly glass ioner cement started to come into the picture. And we had copolite as a desensitizer. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is when I first graduated, it was not about materials and material science. To be a good dentist, you had to be technically excellent. We didn't have a lot of choices. Now, if you open your basic supplier catalog, your shine catalog, you'll see that just on the adhesive page or the desensitizer page, there'll be volumes, multiple, tens and tens of materials, hundreds of materials in bumps. So the contemporary dentist has to look at things completely differently. We've come a long ways and we're moving very fast. So many things to consider. And this is just a screen of buzzwords that are jumping up. But you know what it means to be a dentist these days. Not only do you have to be thoughtful, not only do you have to be excellent with hand skills, you kind of have to be a little bit of a material scientist and you certainly have to keep up with the trends. Let's look at this number. This is a report from Delta Dental, big insurance player. I'm sure many people on the call deal with them. This is their um, National Science Advisory Committee presented this in 2010. And this is not a scientific or an evidence-based report. It's basically their actuary is coming up with data. What they were saying was that, hey, we, we seem to, because our patients stay with the same insurance carrier, a lot of them keep going to the same doctor. When we follow these, where we can, where they're trackable, we seem to be paying for an amalgam replacement about every 11 years and a composite replacement about every five years. So how do we reconcile that in the era of white filling dentistry, composite and aesthetic dentistry? Are amalgams lasting more than double the lifespan of a composite? What does that mean? What can we conclude from these? So we're less than an hour together, we'll focus on some of these biggest challenges, stumbling blocks in practice. We'll talk about bonding and adhesion. We'll talk about direct restorations, the best way to deliver these, the protocols, and hopefully things that will help through all classes of restorations from class one through fives. Now we, we actually have a class six as well. We'll talk about the latest in gadgets and materials and get you updated with that. But at the end of the day, when our procedures for these very simple, restorative, direct procedures we take for granted, when they don't go well, they're a tremendous hit to our productivity, we can measure tangible losses in practice, whether it's financial or goodwill with our patients. And so it's critical to be updated on this. And we know that contemporary dentistry can't be done without adhesion. It revolves around adhesion, whether it's direct or indirect. So if I can give a 10 second slide on what we can normally spend an entire day on, this is just a very, very quick update. Over the last 35 years, as adhesion has actually become a thing in practice, we've gone from the first set of generations of adhesives, the fourth generation would be the first set that actually worked, that was effective, that was predictable, all the way through what we call seventh or universals. It becomes a lot of marketing terms. What that means is we essentially went from the fourth generation, which is a three bottle product. It was a separate etchant, typically phosphoric acid, separate priming bottle and a separate adhesive to a fifth generation that combined a couple of those. The etchant and the primer were combined to a sixth generation where the, um, I'm sorry, fifth generation where the primer and the adhesive was combined, then a sixth generation where the etchant and, and primer were combined to the seventh generation, which now a lot of marketing terms call universals, where everything is all in one bottle. That's literally the timeline in a nutshell. And how do we know which one of these works, which one works better? On top of that, there's lots of stances being taken on how should we etch or condition a tooth? Do we total etch, put phosphoric acid everywhere? Do we use self-etching primers or do we do some hybrid version of that? There's ongoing confusion about delivery techniques. There's the age old discussion about isolation and rubber dams. Why do patients still have sensitivity? And when we are doing direct restorations, do we handle that adhesion differently compared to indirect restorations? So many, so many factors to consider, but here's some of the main bullets. I will tell you, I'll stand on my soapbox and say that adhesive brand and chemistry absolutely matter. The R&D and development behind it absolutely matters. Um, some people are of the thought that it's more the archer, not the arrow. And that couldn't be further from the truth. With this caveat, the best adhesive, when the wrong archer is using it, is not going to work. But the best archer is not going to get great bonds if they're not using an ideal adhesive. 
So both absolutely matter. What we're bonding to matters. We have to be very substrate conscious. Are we bonding to enamel? Are we bonding to dentin? What's the condition of that dentin? How do we apply the different chemistries? Do we have good isolation or is it a contaminated field? Even the restorative material that goes on top and how it's placed makes a difference. And of course, curing is an absolute final step. If that's not complete, and there's not full conversion, doesn't matter how well we did everything before then, we're at risk. So when we talk about adhesion or bonding, there's a basic ISO standardized testing for it. Ultradent developed this. Uh, one of the big things that, that manufacturers tout is sheer bond strength. We've all heard that. We've seen these in the compendiums and literature. Basically, what we get is a tooth that's sectioned in half. We get the middle of it. And if we're going to measure dentin, this composite button is going to be bonded to the middle of the dentin interface of this molar. It's usually a third molar. It's gone through a very uh, precise jig. That means this is a very finite area as far as square millimeters. This is bonded, incubated later put an instron machine and with the shearing force that button is broken off and we measure the effectiveness of that glue how well did it stick to that dentin interface so why do we get so much variance there's so many reasons for that but i'll share with you how com complicated this can be here are two buttons where you can see the footprint of that composite is gone two buttons have been sheared off and i'm sorry this side is cut off but here's a number here. When this one was broken off, there's 30 MPAs, 30 megapascals of force. A lot of people say, well, that's pretty good. I've heard things north of 20 are good and 30s are certainly good. This one was around 70. So what's the difference between these two? Why is it double? Was it the bonding agent? Was it the operator? Was it the composite? What if I told you that it was the exact same operator? in the same lab session with a very standardized technique using the exact same adhesive. And yet you get that much variance. And sometimes the standard deviation is even greater than that. So if you look closely, you'll see where the footprint or the imprint of that button was is very matted and consistent on this one. Versus over here where my cursor is, you can see some clouds or bubbles. That alone means that the adaptive layer, that first layer, whether it's composite or body composite, if it had microscopic gaps or bubbles, that alone could have been the difference in such a wide variation or deviation. And that's just one factor. There's tens of factors that factor into the success of a bond and the strength of the bond, bond strength. If you ask people in the know, scientists, researchers, KOLs, this is probably the, the uh, today's standard. They're going to say, when you're trying to determine how to handle that bonding interface on dentin or enamel, they're gonna to point towards selective etch, which means that we're substrate conscious. If we have enamel involved, phosphoric acid is the gold standard. If we have dentin involved, we generally would prefer to use self-etching primers. Doesn't mean we can't total etch, but there's certain things that we have to pay close attention to, attention to if we're using phosphoric acid directly on dentin. Namely, how long it's on there with precision and after we wash it away, before we apply our next bit of chemistry, how moist that dentin is. We have to really tighten up those tolerances for total etch techniques to work. Selective etch techniques give us a little bit more flexibility with really slightly more standardized and more favorable outcomes. So in a nutshell, in a lecture that could span an entire 24 hours, let's go over some basic principles. Like we said, phosphoric acid, the gold standard for etching uh, enamel. When we're, when we're preparing to bond to enamel, none of the self-etching primers will quite get the same etch patterns, and it's just physics. It's just chemistry. What happens with phosphoric acid, the pH drops below one. It's impossible to have a pH that low with sixth generation or seventh generation universal products. When the etchant or the self-etching primers are combined with other chemistries, they are generally gonna have a higher pH, which means that we don't create the same etch pattern and don't expose the same amount of surface on enamel. So for the best bonds to enamel, we must use phosphoric acid. That said, self-etching primers tend to yield the highest and most stable bonds in dentin. They also tend to reduce the incidence of sensitivity and long-term stability 
tends to go up. There's specific two component, which means six generation, two component bonding systems when tested routinely deliver the absolute highest bond to dentin. And we'll share those, those brand names with you. But in a world where everybody's looking for simplification and there's so much traction gained with these single component adhesives, these universals or seventh generation adhesives, we have to understand that certain ones, even those are not all created equal. And while the highest bond strength attainable to dentin is going to be a standard deviation lower than the two component systems, some of them give us very good functional bonds. Just realize they're not going to be the highest, but they do provide a lot of benefits in practice. For some people, it's a convenience. For some people, it's inventory management. Sometimes they have dual cure conversion components in there. They do simplify, but there is a sacrifice in bond strength. At the end of the day, there's no debate about it. Poor bonds equal lost dollars, and we have to understand that. So I think nothing drives that message better than a set of clinical slides. Dr. Uh, Jelena Jessup shared these with me, and I'm forever grateful to her. Uh, Dr. Jessup is the daughter of the founder of Ultradent, Dan Fisher, and she currently helps run the organization while she's also in private practice. These are slides from many moons ago. I think, in fact, they may have been print film that she con converted to slides. But anyhow, patient came into her office. You can see that there's wall-to-wall -wall amalgams here on back teeth. We've all seen cases like this. This is pretty extreme. Not only are they big MODBLs, you can see there's cervical, there's gonna be lingual lesions. Basically, these teeth are at risk for decapitation. If there's recurrent decay or leakage, we all know what we would do. We'd talk about crowns for these patients. However, this patient was not in a position to be able to do crowns. Um, it was not affordable. They had a large family just wanted to stop the disease process. We all know what we do then as well, right? We tell the patient, hey, start saving up. I'm gonna take these off, remove the decay, do some kind of a buildup, try to buy you time, but sooner or later, preferably sooner, we gotta get crowns on these teeth, otherwise they're at risk for breaking. Well, here she is. Uh, nearly impossible with a rubber dam on because a terminal tooth has prepped 306 degrees of the gum line. The clamp of the rubber dam will fall into that place. It's hard to get our hand pieces back there. So she's done the best she can as far as exposing the areas, mitigating the bleeding. But you can see how these teeth literally are, look like they're about to be decapitated. So we all know what happens. We're going to do something that is aesthetic. We're going to try to figure out how to matrix this, build it up. And to Dr. Jessup's credit, she's an amazing operator. She's done an amazing set of restorations on teeth that look like they're near virgin teeth. But as dentists, we all know, yes, that's great. That show moment for the patient where they can see what the teeth look like before and what they look now is a great warm and fuzzy moment. But what really matters is what these look like in three months, six months, a year, two years. And based on the location, the severity of the breakdown, the predictability of isolation, the verification of decay removal, how unsupported those globs or islands of enamel look like. We know under heavy load on the back in an area that's tough to clean, and it's an area that maybe we could not get the same quality bond that we could get near the front of the mouth. We know what these are going to look like in just a few years. So all those things matter. Isolation, the matrix, the confidence in disease removal, all those things matter. But the biggest challenge, can we really actually restore a modicum of lasting integrity or strength with these teeth? And so we all know what these are going to look like a year or two later, right? Well, here's Dr. Jessup's 15-year post-op. And that shocked me. So that doesn't just speak to her technique and skill at the time of placement. That speaks to her ability to manage and deploy or employ the science during the placement of those composites. This is a gentleman with a lot of load on his teeth. These are molars that he's been biting on for 15 years. Look at what those teeth still look like. I will say that without the maximum attainable shear bond strength on those composites, those restorations would not look like that. And by no means am I advocating that we should be doing these heroic restorations left and right. What I'm saying is that there are times where we don't have an option. 
we can't go to the highest end treatment possible. Patients may not be able to afford the best bonded crown and bridge, or we may want to get them there piecemeal. Or even when we're doing a standard restoration, why not have the best sponsoring possible? And I was really enlightened to this when, um, and in fact, Neil Jessup is the director of R&D, is Jelena's husband. Um, he invited a group of our KOLs, a big group from Catapult, and said, hey, guys, we're going to have a bonding challenge. Get on a plane, put your favorite two bonding agents, adhesives that you swear by and practice in your pockets, come over to Ultradent, we're going to turn over our instrumentation to you, and we're going to do some sheer bond testing. You're going to create these um, buttons and you're going to build up some sample sets. We're going to break them off later and you're going to compare those to what you get with our materials. So we did that. We went in there and we created buttons and we all went in saying, well, we know that we know what we're doing and we know that we've chosen good products. We're going to go in there and by and large, they're all going to be within a range, pretty equal to each other. And I was shocked at the outcome. So shocked that I thought, hey, I'm going to run this same exercise at school with our faculty because there'll be lots of people that'll say, wow, I didn't know that. These are adhesives that we use at our dental school. Up top, you can see there's the Prelude brand of adhesives and Scotch Bond Universal. This is a multi-bottle system that can be used in, in kind of a universal format. Uh, you can use it as a selective etch, total etch. There's a dual link activator in there. And then Scotch Bond is kind of the all-in-one, one one of the big market leaders and a fine adhesive. I brought the two sixth generation or dual bottle systems that we know consistently came in first and second. Through all our testing, and this is lots of third-party testing, Peak Universal from Ultradent routinely finishes number one in sheer bond testing strength. And Optibond XTR from Kerr routinely finishes number two. And all of the other ones are followers behind that. So I did this with my faculty and we did kind of some blind testing where we could be created buttons. I put instructions on there and a group of faculty created a bunch of sample sets with materials that were very familiar with, Prelude and Scotch Bond, because this is what they use daily in at school. Many of them use it in the office. So they knew the instructions down cold. They were, they were teachers. They knew how to instruct others on how to use it. And then I wrote down the instructions from the other two and didn't elaborate. So many of them weren't familiar with PEAK or um, Optibond XDR. I basically had written instructions, told them how to create their samples. They did. And my desk looked pretty funny for a week or two when it was incubated. There the sample uh, buttons made. Um, all the incubators in our biomedical or biomaterial science were being used for something else. So I had to think on the fly. I bought an inexpensive aquarium warmer, put it in there, kept it at about 95 degrees, close to body temperature. And a couple of weeks went by, we had the second session of our Lunch and Learn where we're going to test how well our faculty, our colleagues did breaking these off. So it was a nervous moment. They all wanted to see if there was going to be, you know, egg on their face. Of course, this was blind. We didn't share any names. But here's the data we came up with. Here's our four sets. These were the average shear bond strengths. And look at them. They're all north of 20. And a lot of folks have heard, hey, north of 18.5, if we round that off to 20, north of 20, is a successful bond. Um, I'm going to requalify that before the end of this session. But here's the numbers we got. And when we have the big unreveal, you'll see what the names are. You can see that Peak finished first, Optimon XCR second, and the others were after that. Now, keep in mind, these two were without any coaching. So many of the faculty were novices to using this. If it said scrub for 20 seconds, I timed some of them. They were one, two, three, four, five, seven, 20, and they were done. They were much better about following the instructions on the products that they were routinely using. When we test these in the lab with a little bit of practice where the operators are standardized, we routinely will get averages in the 50s and 60s and sometimes 70s with peak, and XDR usually follows somewhere behind there. So with that said, here's the question. Are all adhesives acceptable? I mean, after all, they all tested north of 20. How strong is strong enough? Am I obsessing over bond strength when it's not clinically relevant? Is there clinical significance? 
Well, then the question to answer is, what are we trying to do with the restoration? My answer, or my question back to you, should we try to build a tooth to its original integrity? If so, what is that? Because here's a violated tooth for decay, for fracture, for whatever reasons, this tooth has been decapitated a little bit. The whole point of restoring it is to try to restore optimal health and function. How do we measure that? Well, here's one way to at least evaluate it. This is not a composite button. This is actually uh, half of a tooth on dentin put on a lathe, and rather than cutting it straight through, they whittled it to where there's a block of dentin sticking out. This is one contiguous mass of dentin, and we're going to do the shear bond strength test on that. We're going to try to break dentin off of dentin, basically measure its co cohesive fracture strength. Here's the data. Things start to approach 100. The average buccal lingual molar is almost 100. Near anterior, uh, facial areas of anterior is 70. So really that 70 to 100 range is when you're actually rebuilding the tooth back to its original strength, which means that you're making that tooth close to as indestructible as it was before it was violated. Doesn't it make sense for that to be our goal? The protocols and techniques you use when we use Peak SC or Peak Universal, I'll review that with you. It's basically a three component system. The universal bond is a universal bond. And it's not that, that again, I said universal is a marketing term. I think Ultradent likes having the word universal on there because other companies use, use it as well. Their definition for universal is not that this is a single component system. It's that it universally bonds to everything. All aspects of teeth, all aspects of restorative substrates. It has the potential to bond to zirconia, ceramics, metal, everything under the sun. However, we do have to condition what we're bonding to. So again, this is where the and or equation comes in. The operator's got to look at it and say, hey, I'm bonding purely to enamel. Phosphoric acid is a gold standard. My substrate is primarily dentin. So I need to use the peak SC, which stands for self-etching, the self-etching primer. Or we combine the two, if there's a critical mass of enamel and dentin, we might use the blue jelly on the enamel and the self-etching primer on the dentin. In either scenario, the final step is the adhesive application. And how that adhesive, how that chemistry embeds and integrates with two structure, how it goes into tubules, how it interacts with interstitial dentin, how it interacts with the collagen, how it goes into etched enamel rods, how well it penetrates, how well it integrates, directly reflects the success of the restoration. Directly is reflective of post-op sensitivity, success, survival, and sheer bond strength. So even then, the best adhesive is never going to guarantee success for us. Um, some of the causes of sensitivity, premature failure, recurrent decay, delamination. Again, we can't harp on this enough. It's isolation that's ignored. Folks not following through with instructions. Not reading the instructions. Notorious or dentists for getting those, or uh, dentists are notorious for getting those little... Um, print out foldable seven different language instructions and throwing them in the garbage and saying, well, I've already bonded before. I know that my last adhesive, I was going to scrub for a certain amount of time and cure for a certain amount of time. I'm good to go. And they just substitute instructions from previous generations of materials for their new generation. Nothing could be more risky than that. Degraded chemistry, not having caps on bottles tight enough, having things age out. That's a big deal. And of course, if everything above that is perfect, not having the right light, the right intensity, and successful curing and conversion could be an issue. So we gotta break each of these down and we're not gonna be able to do it all in a short 55 minute webinar, but let's at least talk about the isolation briefly. And this is where I put my faculty hat and you think we're gonna put everybody in a rubber dam penalty block. Um, that's the first thing as a student that I couldn't wait to abandon and that's unanimous. Most people can't wait to graduate from school so they can say, 
I never want to put another rubber dam on again. Lots of reasons why it's inefficient. Patients don't like it. Takes up time. You know, it eats into our profitability. Remember, it's seven dollars a minute. But the reality is, it's actually the exact opposite. When the field is not controlled well, when there's contamination, you run the risk of premature failure. You run the risk of more emergency visits. You run the risk of patients coming in with sensitivity. All those freebie post-operative adjustments, addressing issues at seven dollars a minute completely erodes away our profits. But there's no argument from my side. Rubber dams are hard to put on. The nice thing is, these days we've got lots of options. And many of these we've tested and done some evidence-based research at school. There are things like the umbrella from Ultradent. There are dry shields, isolites, lots of technology out there that can get the tongue, cheeks, and, and gums away from the teeth and um, create a negative vacuum get better retraction and isolation for us. So these are much faster to use, can be useful, and you pick and choose a particular device based on if you're working more in the anterior or posterior and patient comfort-based decisions, but these are great. So I'm not saying everybody has to go backwards to rubber dam, but it's important to utilize some of these technologies because they'll actually speed up your treatment. You'll actually increase your profitability while improving outcomes, reducing reduce. We can show you lots of data and research on that. That's, again, a conversation for a longer discussion. But um, trust me when I say adding these things will be a coup to your financial success. So what's the reality in practice? What kind of feelings do we place? Here's a breakdown. This is what we all do. Almost half of the restorations we do with direct composites are going to be class twos. Almost another quarter are going to be class ones. And then the balance of the pies, the smaller and smaller pieces, are all of the others. Class threes, fours, fives, class sixes, which are those erosion pits on molars. We won't be able to cover all of these, but the principles we talk about basically can lay themselves over all these restorations. Here's what convention says. This is how I was trained. That when you have a bigger class two composite, for example, that you can choose to put a thin layer of flow at the bottom of the box for a number of reasons that I'm not sure I definitely understood. And I know a lot of people are still vague on this. And then you would start to build your composite in increments, two millimeter increments or less, and ideally kind of cross stack this instead of bonding both walls together and build this up. We did this because if we put a layer equally between two walls, as that composite went through the conversion and shrunk, you would get shrinkage stress pulling those two walls together. And that could be bad for a tooth. So by not linking the walls together and only bonding to one wall at a time, we would largely mitigate that. Of course, manufacturers the whole time are developing better and better composites with different filler profiles where we've reduced shrinkage stress and just overall shrinkage dramatically, but we can never eliminate it. It's always there. Even the best modern composite, it's somewhere hopefully equal or less than 2% 2, 2 total volumetric shrinkage, but it's there. And something we have to be aware of. And we will build this up and eventually have our final capping layer and try to make this look good and function and last. One of the things I forgot to mention when I made this slide was another big reason. Let's say composite resin doesn't shrink at all, which is impossible with resin. Even if we had something that didn't shrink and didn't have all those shortcomings, we still needed to layer because there was no way if we bulk filled all the way through here, five, six, seven millimeters, that we would get reliable convergence at the bottom of this. So that was another reason that we would cure each layer incrementally so we could get successful cure through and through. Well, that begs the question about bulk fills and they have come into the market. At first, there was lots of speculation about them, but then now they're standing the test of time. They've been developed. And so we need to look at this and see how different manufacturers skin that cat. If we look at the smaller box on the left, that is a traditional incremental layer that we just talked about. One strategy is to still put a flowable base at the bottom, but if we wanted to not painstakingly layer a composite, we could consider one of the manufacturer's products that is a bulk fill, a bulk body material that we would sculpt the same way, but basically fill and eliminate some of those increments. There's definitely advantages and disadvantages to this. The obvious disadvantage is if shrinkage stress is still an issue, building up that big of an increment 
could be a problem. Secondly, we have to have confidence that light can penetrate to the bottom of that since we're filling it up all the way and we have to be confident about the conversion. Conversely, the advantage is the less layering we do, the less likely we are to build small voids and micro gaps between each layer. After all, placing a composite is difficult and the more you pat it in and put a new layer and pat it in, the more likely you are to have some instrument tug back and get some gaps and voids. Then others have come up with alternate options, which is to use a phase change. Basically use either a paste paste material or use sonic energy to get a body material and turn it temporarily flowable. And there's some examples on the right where they can say, hey, we have a deeper potential bulk fill, whether it's a dual cure material or something that we can then accelerate with a light. And there's advantages and disadvantages there. The advantages are since that body material, that final material actually has a flowable nature initially, it can go down in here and seal all the nooks and crannies. Theoretically, we don't need a more runny flowable layer to seal all the interfaces. Disadvantage, as you build it up, because this is a fluid material, it's much harder to carve in ideal anatomy and shapes. So we rely more on rotary instrumentation to carve backwards. And when we're trying to make inspired looking restorations, it's really hard to carve in anatomy. We wind up making concave divots into a tooth rather than convex natural looking anatomy. And finally, another option is to use some of the new bulk fill flowable technologies. Now it's like composite in a garden hose. Rather than a very thin layer of flowable, we would put a, pit, uh, put a thicker layer in here and fill up maybe the bottom half to two thirds, rapidly fill that up, cure that, and then use a body capping layer on the top. In the hands of a skilled dentist, all of these theoretically would work if we have a great adhesive layer and we have really good composites. So then the composite matters as well and how much science and R&D is behind there. So let's look at a, a clinical case with a class two. This is a very typical scenario. Here's a patient with kind of that fruit salad dentistry done over different generations. And we've determined that this first bicuspid has recurrent decay around the amalgam as well as the mesial component has decay. So we put a wedge in there and that wedge has a small little metal shim because we want to be conservative with this prep. Unlike amalgam preps, we don't have to blow out our contacts. So that little bumper, this is a wave wedge from Triadent that Ultradent carries, provides me a little insurance from this tooth. So as my burrs get close, since I don't have to blow out these contacts, I'm not nicking the adjacent tooth. The decay is removed, the disease is removed, everything left is healthy. It's just stained or tattooed from the amalgam. There's our sectional matrix system, the Triadent, which is basically my favorite, the one that's my go-to. And here's the flowable layer at the bottom of the box and the occlusal pulpal ismuth area. And then within a couple layers, we have that tooth restored. This should be very, very fast. You can see that there's a nice light in place. I have an opter gate to keep the lips out of the way. We wanna be able to predictably work efficiently fast and give the patient a restoration that hopefully is gonna last forever. They all look good here, given we spent a little bit of time making it look nice. But how long this lasts comes down to all the things we talked about leading up to this point. So how to make these things look good. And when a patient sees this, I always show them before with an intro camera, a during so they can see the stain and decay and disease and an after. Inevitably, they look at it and say, wait a minute, when can I do this tooth? When can I do this tooth? It just goes on. So good dentistry tends to beget more elective dentistry. So you notice we talked about a sectional matrix system. Here's a tree dent system. If you haven't tried it, or if you're not happy with your sectional system, or better yet, if you're still using Toffelmeyers and those types of matrices, definitely, definitely invest in a 3D system. This is the one that I think is the best in the market. It comes with its useful tool set, the expanding pliers that can get around any molar. And what's really cool is this articulating set of pin tweezers that allows you to put all their little intricate bits and pieces, wedges, sectional bands into place very easily and effectively. The thing for folks need to understand is there's a paradigm change between composite dentistry and amalgam dentistry. With amalgams, 
The way we got a successful contact, which is always a pain point for composites, is we would put our band in and just wedge the heck out of that tooth. We would try to soften the PDLs on the two teeth, separate them out, wedge that tooth open, and that space that we would move would make up for the thickness of the band. All the while, as we condensed amalgam in there, it would bubble out and it would burnish against the matrix band. Because the box and the prep were blown out, we could then get in with our carvers and shape and carve the edges and try to give anatomy, try to give a convex marginal ridge and in a proper embrasure. So the teeth would be anatomical. Early amalgam or composite adapters who started to use composite, but use it with amalgam based technology, wind up getting very inferior contacts until these sectional systems came around. It's really critical to understand that the sectional ring is what gives us a space. That's what takes place of the wedge. The wedge is mainly there while, yes, you can wedge a tooth apart, it's mainly there to create our gingival seal. You want that wedge to seal that sectional band against the gingival aspect of that tooth, against the buccal and lingual, so we have less trimming and finishing to do because cured composite is a whole different story than unset or partially set amalgam that's carvable. Again, let's look at some clinical cases. There's a big trend these days to try to simplify shading. And I think that's amazing. Trying to come up with these omnichromatic composites that derive color based on their filler profile from the adjacent tooth. So we don't have these complex 30, 40 shade composite kits where we pay a lot of money, wind up using the same two or three favorite shades, and a lot of the other expensive composites go uh, extinct. They basically run out their shelf life and they go bad and we have to toss them. So I think that's a great, great thing, trying to simplify shades and use some of these um, universal coloring schemes. Here's just an example of a tooth where we've just picked a universal shade that's supposed to derive color. And you can see, yes, we can see where the filling is, but this is magnified 50 times. Inside of a mouth, when you give a patient a mirror, they're gonna look at that and say, wow, that tooth looks like it wasn't restored. Of course, a big part of it is putting reasonable anatomy and polishing it, but these are great. So I will jump out of the presentation real quickly just to show you a video because one of the composites I'm very hot on right now is from Ultradent. Transcend Universal Composite. Perform restoration in just one step. Transcend Composite's universal body shape blends with almost any tooth color without the need for a blocker, allowing you to use one shade for the majority of your restorations. It's not magic, it's science. Instead of relying solely on traditional pigments or on particle size alone to create different shades, Transcend Composite uses resin particle match technology. The closely matching refractive indices of the resin and particles allow the composite to take on the surrounding tooth color, creating a beautiful shade match for your restorations. Plus, the Super Nano Hybrid formula gives Transcend Composite excellent handling properties, sculptability, gloss retention, and the flexibility and strength you need in a restoration without sacrificing aesthetics. For cases that call for a layering technique, or if you prefer to layer your composite, Transcend Composite also includes six additional shades, four dentin shades, and two enamel shades that take the complexity out of layering. Transcend Composite ultra dent quality and our most simplified shade system yet all right so i don't usually like to run a commercial except that video actually puts it pretty clearly and in a short period of time it probably would have taken me much longer to describe the technology behind that long story short i've been using it in the office and you can see that even in the master kit, there's maybe seven total shades. You can get most of your meat and potatoes based posterior dentistry done just with that universal body. But of course, there are some universal dentin shades, the basically three shades of dentin and a couple of shades of overlay enamel that allows us to pretty much handle almost any complex aesthetic uh, case that we need to tackle in the anterior zone as well. So it just simplifies inventory. It's easier for us. It's easier for our assistants. It's more economical. We're not throwing away material that's getting expired. So something to look at if you've been looking 
for a new composite. At the end of the day, like I said, no matter how well we place that composite, we've got to be able to bring it to a nice finish. Uh, there's lots of different finishing products and materials out there. There's discs, points, cups. Most of the manufacturers now are starting to realize how much better these specifically designed discs are, where they have these little rivets added to them. Think about these as those giant chamois in a car wash. Things that are very firm and rigid, like a cup or a point, anything that's rotary tends to obliterate anatomy. These flexible discs, and these are the Jiffy Naturals um, from UltraDeath, other manufacturers make similar products, will tend to bend and move into the anatomy without wiping the anatomy away. So after your gross adjustments for any minor occlusal adjustments are done, you literally have to hit them with these two-step polishers. That's what you saw in the cases before. The um, pre-finish, which is the yellow, and the fine finish, which is the white color. And that will give you life-changing results as far as how easy it is to polish these composites. You'll, you'll have a very noticeable improvement. And of course, they do make discs and things that are designed for embrasures and anterior cases as well. So then the next natural question we've talked about adhesion we've talked about isolation we've talked about bonding talked about polishing what particular composite should we use and like i said i showed you one of my favorites this is where it's more the archer as long as you're using a contemporary composite yes i would like to steer you towards my favorites but as long as it's a contemporary composite with a good filler profile it comes down to the practitioner what their preferences are do they want a firmer composite they want a creamier composite my point that I would make is it's better to understand the importance of having a variety of viscosities. I think it's hard to do your best dentistry without being able to modulate without being able to modulate that viscosity. Viscosity modulation helps us in a lot of circumstances. If it's prep design issues where it's a minimally invasive prep, it's hard to get a thick body composite down to a bottom of a narrow little box or a tiny V-shaped fissurotomy. We have to look at the expected load that restoration is designed to handle. Is the restoration like a class five in an area where the tooth may flex? How well can that restoration adapt to that bonded layer so we don't sacrifice our sheer bond strength? What's the handling like? What is the aesthetic and polish outcomes going to be like? There's just so many choices, and I don't think we can always do everything with a single viscosity. So combinations of viscosities give us more tools in our tackle box. And with that, we'll kind of graduate to the class five discussion. Um, how do we restore these? You know, the questions to ask, is it a carious class five? We're very comfortable with those. Say there's class five decay. We know that we're supposed to take that out and restore it. What about what we used to call abfraction lesions, which is a term that's going out of style. It's uh, what Grippo described a few decades back. Well, he related these formation of these lesions strictly to occlusion and tooth vibration. Now the contemporary term for them is NCCLs, non carious cervical lesions. And Abraham described that a lot of these may have to do with abrasion uh, related to toothbrush, but more importantly related to the denifrice or the toothpaste on that toothbrush and how rough or coarse that is. We know there's potentially an erosive component, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic acids. Is the patient sucking on lemons? Did they have reflux? There may be linked to sleep and parafunction, polypharma, dry mouths, mouths that don't buffer. There's so many variables here and we're starting to understand that better and better. If you ever get a chance to attend an erosion, abrasion type of course, I highly recommend it. A couple of articles that folks can read just to get grounded on this. But the big question, should we restore these class five lesions? The answer is gonna be coming depending on who you ask it from. In my opinion, and I never say always or never in dentistry, but I can say almost always, I believe we should almost always replace these. Because here's a perfect example. Here's a big divot. Do we decide to restore it here? Well, if you move down towards the front of the line, you can see where there are medium sizes and there's baby starter sets. Why do we say, hey, let's watch your tooth disintegrate and melt away and then when it's this bad, when it's ready to fracture at the gum line, or when it's bothering you so much that it's sensitive or it's unsightly, that's when we should restore it. Why do we want to watch these small lesions grow up to be bigger lesions? 
Sometimes it's really important to the patient. They're right in the front window and it's an aesthetic concern for them. So why so many choose not to restore them is this reason. Here's somebody that did a few of them. They're already starting to see stains around a couple and a couple of them popped out. And sometimes some people say that these, and these are ones that I just found on the web and forums and blogs saying, why are my class fives looking like this just within a few months to a couple of years of restoring them? There's recurrent decay. Am I doing good or harm? Do I have to dig those out and waste more tooth structure because I created a canopy that wasn't cleansable and bacteria leaked in there? And these go from bad to worse. So there's the answer. If this is what our restorations look like, then we're probably better off not restoring them because we're probably doing more harm to the patient than good. I will say that I restore almost exclusively all of my class fives with flowable composite, which surprises people. But what it does do for me, it gives me placement precision. It helps that the composites in a class five area aren't under the same load demands that what I would need on the occlusal of a tooth, where it's a load bearing chewing restoration because the class, the flowable resins are not as filled at the neck of the tooth. What I care more about is the flexural modulus and flowable composites tend to flex more similarly to dentin, so they're willing to move with that tooth rather than be so rigid that they'd risk popping out. But we have a way to place them where we can decouple the walls and basically neutralize the effect of shrinkage stress because shrinkage stress is higher with flowables as long as they're bound to two walls. If we cannot bind them to two walls, there won't be the same amount of shrinkage. And I'm sorry, there's a little sun coming at me, so I'm gonna move my computer over. Finally, using flowable gives me much faster, more efficient placement. And that usually equates to faster finish and polish, less burr on tooth, which could bruise and hurt the healthy dentin or cementum below the restoration, really good aesthetics. And more importantly, restorations that last don't look bad. So these are just sample type of photos of some of the hands-on courses we do. We just said on to the operators here, get a class five and carve an imaginary um, or get, get a tooth and carbon imagery class five or NCCL prep in there. Try to make it look like an NCCL restoration, an abrasion or erosion lesion. After that, we don't just go in and restore. So if this is a live tooth, the surface is roughened up. Theoretically, a patient comes in with you here. I don't prep anymore and I certainly don't put any retention features. I do get kind of a rounded ended fine diamond and I basically buff the surface of this. I want to make sure that's clean dentin I'm bonding to. The majority of the time I can do this without anesthetic. So I'm not prepping, taking away anything significant other than at the micron level. It's the equivalent of me sanding a deck before I varnish it. However, everything north of that on the enamel margin, I'm going to create an erratic bevel. You guys can see those. It looks like an EKG line. This erratic bevel needs to be irregular as possible. Some of these projections come up higher. Some of them lower. Some of them are deeper. Make this as irregular as possible. And many people think, well, that's to increase surface area. Yes, it does do that. But if surface area is what gets us our bond, our bond isn't strong enough. The main reason we do that is for optics, improving the final aesthetic outcome. Here's just a sample case of my cousin who moved out of the country, was under a lot of stress, and decided to brush away all of his gums and a lot of his enamel and dentin and then later that was compounded with an erosive-based acid disease. So after I saw him after five years, I said, oh my God, what happened to you? You had a lot more tooth and gum when I last saw you. This is an immediate referral and consultation with a periodontist. There's gonna be some grafting and he looks like this in every quadrant. But I also need to now cover up this vulnerable dentin, otherwise it's gonna keep eroding away. So there's that exactly that erratic bevel that we talked about. And then we'll go in here and incrementally build up one layer of flowable at a time with a more viscous flowable that doesn't run. I drag it into place with an explorer, cure it so it's only bound to the one wall, to the gingival wall, and put the next layer in the next layer. I'm basically filling up this lesion with three or four layers at a time, each time controlling the shrinkage. And with that placement, this is me after the final cure before I finished any of that. So think about how this looks. If this is this clean right after placement, think about amount, the amount of time it's gonna take me to finally refine and polish that, and how well that matches and looks. We can crank these out 
five to 10 minutes per restoration. So if somebody has 12 of these in their mouth, you can restore the entire mouth if you're not having to use anesthetic very quickly with creative isolation devices. And at the end, as we're coming towards the end of the presentation, like I said at the beginning, none of this matters. These techniques that we talked about, none of it matters unless we get predictable curing conversion. Um, no matter what third-party evaluator you read, consistently from Christensen on up, consistently the Velo line of products comes out as the top most recommended curing light in the industry, and it's for good reason. They're on their third generation now. They started with Velo and went to Velo Grand, and now the latest is Velo X. Um, if you're looking for a curing light, this is the one that will tick off all the boxes, satisfy all the needs you might have. I would go on and watch some videos on this. It's easy to look up content on this. When you buy one, whether you like to work with corded or non-corded and just use the chargeable battery, it comes with both. So you don't have to buy one or the other. And it's got lots of features. Besides the standard power mode, it's got an extra power mode to get you where you're going faster. And with the haptics available, this is like a wand. You can toggle through all the programs with a button or you can just shake this side to side or a drum beat up and down. And you can toggle between intensities or the various diagnostic modes. So you can go to the white light diagnostic mode that also helps with shade selection. You can go to the black light diagnostic mode, which helps identify and fluoresce this GMA product. So you can see where there's composite when you're trying to remove it. It has low battery indicators. It's uh, everything you need. More importantly, it's got a footprint bigger than the Velo Grand, which is formerly the biggest footprint. When you have this, you're not going to have cold spots at areas that are not covered. With traditional curing lights, you can see you have to go through and cure multiple areas on a tooth. The Velo X is the one that can handle the biggest molar, the biggest veneer on a central incisor. And time is money and curing, curing conversion equals success. In addition to that, you can buy lots of additive lenses that are very inexpensive to, to have transillumination in a proximal detection, tack curing of veneers. So this one investment will last a lifetime. So with that said, we're at the end of our hour, uh, just to review some take homes. We wanna respect tooth structure of the old adage, once you remove it, it's gone. Stay ahead and abreast some materials. You guys all have the right attitude in mind because you're logging on after a day of work listening to a webinar. Really understand the principles of adhesion and how to get the best bonds possible and take advantage of products or technologies that help get us um, better outcomes and ideally, get us better outcomes faster. That's a rare thing where you can combine both of those. So take advantage of those products or technologies, capitalize on them. It's a rare opportunity. With that, I will thank everybody for attending. There's my email again. I will just stop sharing my screen now and go to the Q&A. Um, a question from Paris. In what instance would you use the Jiffy wheels? Those are those polishes I showed versus the brush and vice versa. Um, the Jiffy wheels that I saw that you guys saw was in that black burr holder. There were discs that had the little rivets added to them. Those will work anywhere, anterior and posterior. The little things that look like tulips or blooms are really designed to go into the occlusal anatomy of posterior teeth. Although I pretty much can finish all posterior teeth with those Jiffy wheels as well. The brush was um, a Jiffy, very stiff brush was something that was invented. I still use it but it was really useful back when we had very, very rigid points and cups that didn't fit into occlusal anatomy. So it's an, it's got added flexibility. The brush wasn't pictured. If you like to use a Jiffy brush, it's a great way to finish. But with those universal um, Jiffy polishes that I showed you, I, I find the need to use a brush even less and less. Okay, how do you feel about total etch and then it says fight back followed by bonding. I'm not quite sure, that might be a typo, but total etch and bonding, like I said, works. Any of those um, modalities work to get an outcome. Total etch works great on enamel. On dentin, we tend to get slightly lower values, but with the right adhesive, for example, with Peak Universal, if you chose to total etch a dentin, you still get very high bond values, maybe in the magnitude of five or six megapascals lower. 
but it's incumbent on having precise technique over the moisture. So as you wash the etch away, if you over dry, you could be dead in the water. If you leave too much water. So total etch technique when it's involved into dentin implies that the operator is gonna have perfect control over the moisture of the dentin. And total etch technique with dentin is how the idea of moist dentin bonding was ushered in because we don't have the flexibility to dry or over dry like we can sometimes um, kind of over dry dentin or enamel and desiccate it and we're not in as much of a trouble. Um, uh, what mode do you typically use your Velo in for curing composite? Like I said, there's several generations of Velo. If you have the Velo Grand, they have the standard power mode, mid power mode, and then the extreme high power mode. I'll use standard or mid power on the Velo Grand. On the Velo X, I'll use the high power frequently. The times I toggle back to the standard power is when I'm on class fives. A tooth can absorb the heat, and even if you're relatively close to the pulp, the white dissipates that when it's tooth. However, when I'm curing a class five, my light is hovering at the gum line as well. There's a few millimeters usually at the gum line. And so in that case, I don't want any light that gets too hot. So I'll typically drop to standard power mode. Hopefully that answered your question. Do you, this is a very good question. Do you recommend Permaseal or any other topper, basically an overglaze material over your composites? And I would say absolutely not. I wind up using Permaseal to gussy or glam up my crown and bridge provisionals. Um, there's no doubt that when the composites are placed, especially when it's lesser technique, there could be voids. If it's good, not good polishing, there's chatter and voids. And any kind of an overglazed medium will fill in those. And when you hit it with a light, it looks more shiny, it looks prettier, but most of those overglazed materials are worn out in three to six months. And they're certainly gone after a few profi cycles when the hygienists go over with a profi cup. So if we're using as a crutch to overcome our poor final finish or our poor final outcome, that's going to wear away. I want to be able to see poor outcomes. I want to be able to see voids, pits, and stains later to say, hey, I have to up my game. I got to work on my placement and work my finish. However, I love using it for, like I said, provisionals and trying to really make interim restorations look better. What flowables are you using for your class five restorations? Um, I wind up using the Ultradent Permaflow flowable, which is very runny for a lot for my class twos, class ones, because it grows and drips right to the bottom of those tough to reach places. For class fives, I need them to be a little bit more stackable. And so I wind up using ones that have more varying viscosities. One of my favorites happens to be the Voco product, Grandioso Flow. It looks like. Um, all the questions are answered. So I want to thank everybody again. And like I said, you have my emails. If there's questions that you think up later, I love to hear from people.